And here we go. Here we go. <laughs> so welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, I guess we're, we're, we're in it. It looks like we have a quorum. So we're just gonna, we're gonna roll this one right on in. Welcome to another uh, episode of our Cocktails in Conversation, part of our Industry Insider Series, where we talk to folks that we uh, either already love or have it admired from afar and finally got a chance to chat with, um, as is this week's, this week's case, uh, Luke Zaber and myself, Shannon Healy, along with Claire Katati, uh, running everything like the uh, man behind the curtain for us here. This week, we're very excited to have Lynn House. She is, well, is a brand educator for Heaven Hill? I have a really long title. I love it. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Uh, so my official title with Heaven Hill is the National Spirits um, Specialist and Portfolio Mixologist for the portfolio of Heaven Hill Brands. So You might win for longest title. <laughs> it's a really long title. It does not fit on a business card. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like you just hand people a QR code. No, You're just, like, it's too I, long to print. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hmm. Well, welcome, welcome. We have, uh, of course, heard about you for quite a while, and Luke and I were really excited uh, when Dawson uh, was able to, our, our local uh, Republic uh, rep, was able to get make this happen, make this connection. So thank you, Dawson. Um, That's awesome. Also a big thank you to James. And also thank you to James. Hey, is James on the call? <laughs> We're, we're teasing. We're teasing James today. He's been... James. Up, uh, I love Dawson. I've been working with Dawson for years. So Dawson's amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. You're too kind. <laughs> well, yeah, let's not say anything nice about Dawson. Okay, it goes to her head. Um, so, Lynn, thank you very, very much for being here. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, one of the reasons we're excited to have you is uh, we like Dubonnet. And we've been kind of singing the song of Dubonnet for quite a while now. And you have a, an integral part in this story. So if maybe we could start with like just a brief what it is, uh, and then maybe we can, you can guide us through a tasting of it. Uh, and then, because we're going to use Dubonnet in all of the cocktails today, right? Yeah. Oh, two of the cocktails. Two of the three, yes. Okay, perfect. So we're pouring a little bit here. So, um, you know, we want to know in real time. Hopefully folks at home are also have access to Dubonnet. There we go. If not, you can always get it from our store. Exactly. Yeah. Opa. I am so passionate about this spirit. I can't even tell you all. Um, and it comes from even before I got into cocktails. Uh, my degree is in theater and I was a professional actor. But my love was history. I loved history. And I, when I was in you know, junior high and high school, I was like, I'm going to be a history major. And they're like, well, that's a useless degree. And what's more useless? Become an actor. So that's mm -hmm. what I did. Yep, I went the similar route. <laughs> so, but I mean, I love history. I'm giddy about it. And this is such a historical brand. And the story of Dubonnet actually happens honestly, centuries before what you're tasting right now. So it actually goes back to 1630. So 1630, think about that folks, 1630, we're going back centuries from where we are now. And Dubonnet came out of um, what was happening in the Andes region of what we call Peru right now. And its main botanical is Chinchona. So we all know about that in tonic water and other things and Chinchona is like a really amazing botanical. Um, but the chi was known as Kina Kina, which is what quinine and that's the identifiable botanical that has healing benefits for it. Um, and Kina Kina means literally bark of barks. So this was a holy bark in the Andes region in what we call Peru right now. And we're talking 1630 right now. 
And what happened was the Count and the Countess of Chinchon, which was a region in the Basque region of Spain, were visiting because Spain had um, rule over, you know, uh, Peru at that time. So they were visiting and the Countess became very, very sick. She had a high fever and nothing, none of their medicines were working. But the indigenous people knew that if you bathed in the water where the bark from the kina kina tree fell into you, there you would be healed. And so that's what they did. And she was healed um, from her fevers and was healthier. And what happened then forth, they called it uh, Chinchona in honor of her, even though it had been called Kina Kina. So Kina Kina is where quinine, where that comes from. That's a derivative of an indigenous word for um, the people of Peru. But Chinchon, um, as we also know, comes from the Countess. So they named the tree Chinchona tree and the bark tree, they called it the Jesuits bark. All of that, they realized no one could identify what its healing power was until like the 1700s. And then that kind of botanical was isolated. So we learned that what we call Chinchona now or quinine has this amazing healthy healing property. And that's actually the beginnings of Dubonnet was the recognition of the fact that this herb, this botanical from the tree bark had great properties that could help people out. Now we flash forward to the 1700s and then it's being used, it's called Jesuit's bark, they're grounding it up, but it's an incredibly bitter herb if you have it on its own, like to enjoy quinine on its own, which is the reason why tonic water has so much sugar in it, is because quinine is incredibly bitter and quinine is the botanical deri derivative of what we get from the chinchona tree. 1846, we flash forward. Um, the French Foreign Legion is in Africa and the soldiers are dealing with malaria and these high fevers. And the only thing that treats it is this quinine derivative, but it's so bitter. So the French Foreign Legion literally ran a marketing campaign that um, tested, you know, like challenged people to create a formula that made quinine palpable. And the winner of this marketing campaign was a gentleman by the name of Joseph Dubonnet. And he, not only was he a wine merchant, but he was also a trained alchemist. So he brought in herbs and sugar and chocolate. And he created this quinine spirit that was literally produced as medicine. Now, when you look at um, any of the marketing for Dubonnet, you'll always see a woman associated with it and a cat associated with it. His wife, Madame Dubonnet, actually likes the medicine more as an aperitif, not just medicine. And she, they were of a certain set in um, Aristotle, you know, um, as far as being elevated in the community. And so she held parties and such. And so she would serve this medicine that her husband created as an aperitif at these parties and she loved her cat. And so when it finally becomes a commercial brand in 1846, um, Joseph Dubonnet puts his wife's cat on the label, which is why a cat's always associated with it. And we've redone that with this re new bottling of um, the American version of Dubonnet, because there's two formulas of Dubonnet. But um, the cat is put on there because it's paying homage to his wife. A lot. Nice. <laughs> so can you um, talk to us about the flavor profile? It's an aromatized fortified wine. Uh, exactly. So wine is the base. So if you think about the French formula, it's, it was Bordeaux wines. It was, you know, Claret and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and such. So it's a red wine based aperitif. 
Um, when we say aperitif and aromatize, we mean there's other botanicals added on there. When we were reformulating this, um, what we were discovering were not only the gentian, so gentian is a bittering component, uh, chinchona, which is the main flavor, and chinchona versus gentian is the main difference between it and a vermouth. Vermouth is going to have gentian in it, um, quinas are going to have quinine in it, so chinchona bark in it. But there was citrus, there was chocolate, there was all these things. Um, if you look historically at the American version of Dubonnet, what happened in the 1940s was um, Dubonnet had become a huge, huge, hugely enjoyed um, aperitif across the world, but it wasn't here in the United States. And they wanted to bring it to the US, but it was a French owned property. And at that time, France was under Nazi occupation. So there was a hesitancy to bring anything French into the country because we didn't want to bring in anything that was Nazi occupied. So what the Dubonnet family, and at this point in time, you're like third, fourth generation, what they did was they sent a family representative and they talked about the recipe and there was a domestic version created. So still to this day, there is a European version and there is a domestic version. And what Heaven Hill owns the rights to is the domestic version. So the domestic version obviously did not use French wine, it used California wine. So Cabernet, Sauvignon, and other um, varietals that were coming out of that, but still bringing in those botanicals and primarily the chinchona bark, so quinine, um, was really important. Okay. Awesome. Uh, are we ready to make a cocktail? Yeah. I'm ready to make a cocktail. Let's do it. Hey, so Lynn, if you wouldn't mind just adjusting your camera a little bit, uh, you seem to be cutting your the top of your face off. How's that? There you go. Perfect. Excellent. So could you walk us through your, your, your this cocktail, which is a classic, correct? This is a classic cocktail. So this first cocktail is called the Dandy. Um, and this is a cocktail that you actually, if you go into old school cocktail books, um, particularly the um, Savoy cocktail book, um, uh, Heracratic 1920s. Um, as I mentioned, Dubonnet was a spirit that was enjoyed all over the world you know, um, prior to what we know and kind of rediscovering the spirit right now. So this is a classic cocktail and it's a bourbon cocktail, which I work for a whiskey company. So loving to discover old, new bourbon cocktails. And it's kind of in the line of what we would call like a Manhattan or a Boulevardier, just a nice aperitif style cocktail. So we're gonna start with bourbon. I'm gonna use Elijah Craig. Um, I like it with Dubonnet because Dubonnet has these great rich flavors of blackberry and currant and black tea. So it lends itself to a nice bolder um, whiskey. So we're going to use Elijah Craig and I poured an ounce and a half in there. And then I'm going to take the Dubonnet itself. So the one thing I want to tell everybody with an aperitif, once you open it, you want to refrigerate it because it's a wine base. It's not a spirit base. So you want to preserve the quality of it. And so I'm going to add an ounce and a quarter of Dubonnet. And this is going to be a stirred cocktail, which is why I'm putting it in my glass right here. And you always want a little bit of sweets. I think um, on the recipe, it says Cointreau. I don't have Cointreau at home. I have another Curacao, so essentially an orange liqueur. Um, triple sec, Cointreau, um, this is Pierre Ferrand's dry Curacao. I'm just gonna put a quarter of an ounce in that. If you want a little bit of extra sweet in there just to balance it. So we put that in there. And then I'm gonna get my ice scoop. My, my mixing glass. Stir it. 
Now there's a bitter component. There is um, dry orange bitters and Angostura bitters. I don't put the bitters in until the end because bitters are a little more delicate when you're comparing them to a natural spirit. And if you put them in too early, I think you blow off some of the components. So that's just a little secret cocktail making of mine. Now I'm gonna add my two dashes of orange. And two dashes of Angostura. And I'm just gonna stir that gently at the end because I don't wanna blow it off. And what I've already done is I've chilled my coupe glass. Why cold is important is it just allows the cocktail to exist for a longer period of time. I'm gonna strain this cocktail in. As you can see, a perfect balance. And then some fresh citrus as a garnish. Um, I'm preferential to orange. So a nice peel. So something else too for you all at home, like peel your garnish to order. There's oils that are in the skin and that's actually what creates. It's not just being something pretty, it's being aromatic. So that's why we squeeze it over the top because we want those oils to dance on top of the cocktail. And then we give it a little twist and turn. And there's the Dandy, a classic cocktail from the 1920s. Utilizing Dubonnet, bourbon, you know, just reminds us of the heritage of this great spirit. Cheers. Standing. Cheers. I'm getting there. You're doing a great job. I'll pull some chocolate and Dubonnet. I can watch you work all day. <laughs> it's That's usually how it goes. Chocolate and Dubonnet. So you may get a little Tootsie Roll kind of flavoring out of that. Um, some other herbs, black currant, black tea, chocolate. Um, those were classic ingredients that were used back in the day for this amazing aperitif. And we have still kept those botanicals in this current formulation of it. So if I'm just smelling the Dubonnet straight, mm -hmm. am, am I getting floral waters? Mm -hmm. Like aromas, of, like floral aromas? Uh, floral makes sense. Um, you're definitely going to get citrus. You're definitely going to get chocolate. And the new reformulation compared to where Dubonnet was about uh, six years ago, we brought in black tea. We blood, brought in black currants. Uh, we increased the amount of chinchona because chinchona is what differentiates it from a, you know, a vermouth style aperitif. Um, but floral elements make complete sense. So one of our fellows has a, uh, has a question. Ed has a question. Ed, yeah, you want to just hi. unmute uh, yourself? Um, yeah, uh, I think I have. Yeah, I've unmuted myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I went to the ABC store, and the only Dubonnet they were carrying was the white. Um, so my first question is, is that, Substantive, substantively different from the red. Uh, I was looking for the red, but my my next question sort of goes into that. I mixed up this drink, and we're sitting here enjoying it, and um, it turned out to be quite bitter. So I think the quinine or whatever it is is coming across as a as a leading flavor. And so I added a little bit of simple syrup and it made it really, really smooth. And now I'm worried that I'm gonna to have to drink more and more and more of this. <laughs> so there, there's a bunch of answers to what you're saying. So we, there actually used to be a Dubonnet White. We have not been, from a company standpoint, making that. It's like white vermouth, red vermouth. Same concept there. Uh, right now we're focusing. So what you found was, and good on you for finding Dubonnet Blanc, um, because we haven't been making that for about two years. And so that's kind of a rare thing to find. Um, I know, <laughs> exciting. Um, understand that quinine is an incredibly bittering, bittering component. So sometimes for your own personal flavor palette, 
you're going to want to add a little Scotia simple syrup to it just because like I'm a bitter girl, so I love it hard and bitter all the time, but that's not everyone's palate. Some people want things a little sweeter and that's the only, that's what I always tell about cocktails. When I put a recipe out, I'm just giving you a framework to work from. You tweak it to what you want. Uh, but we are not making the Dubonnet Blanc anymore. So what you found is a rare thing and something old. Uh, we may remake it in the future, but we're not making it. We haven't made it for the last two years. Um, but that bitter that you're tasting is the chinchona bark. It's the quinine. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn, you mentioned refrigerating after you open it. So yeah. when, when you talk about vermouths, uh, which is also aromatized fortified wine, kind of the same overarching family. Uh, the general rule of thumb is the sweeter it is, the longer it'll last. Um, how long do you think uh, Duvernay will, uh, an open bottle of Duvernay uh, will last in the refrigerator? So absolutely. So sugar is a preservative as many other things are preservatives with spirits. And we also know that chilling something slows down oxidation and all of that. Um, an open bottle of Dubonnet will keep its flavor if you refrigerated it for about three months. Okay, okay. that's actually the same rule of thumb for any kind of vermouth that you're using. That's always the thing that freaks me out when I go to a bar and they make a Manhattan for me because Manhattan is my most favorite cocktail in the world. And I see them pulling a vermouth off the back bar and it's not refrigerated. That's a wine-based aperitif. It's different than a whiskey, a gin, a vodka, a tequila. It doesn't have the same stability. So it needs to be refrigerated from the moment it's open and it needs to be kept out of sunlight because it's wine-based, so it's a little more delicate. So I want everyone to understand that. Like if you have this stuff at home, which is one of the reasons like I always thought was great, like Julia Child used to talk to all the time about uh, cooking with vermouth. So it's a great thing that like if your vermouths or your wine based aperitifs are starting to get to that age point, you can cook with them, you can deglaze with them. Um, but I would say a month to three months, keep it in your refrigerator, keep it out of sunlight, you'll be good. Nice, nice. Do you have any favorite recipes for food that you, you were uh, willing to share with us? Oh, for food? Um, with using so Dubonnet? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I love Dubonnet and mushrooms. So I do a lot of like grilling and I like to like cook some mushrooms and stuff like that. And I think it just makes a really great deglazing sauce because it's already got all of the botanical components in it with the herbs, the citrus, the blackberry, the tea, the chocolate, the wine base. Um, and then that works really nicely with mushrooms. So if I'm doing a great steak, I love to like sear a steak in a pan, take it out and then deglaze it with um, Duvernay. Excellent, that does sound delicious. So it's interesting that you, you mentioned that uh, about Julia Child's eating vermouth because for a blanc, which is, you know, for a blanc sauce, it's one of the most uh, mother sauce, uh, originally it's, it's uh, it's not blanc, it's not white wine, it was white vermouth. Correct. Which, yeah, I, I think I, well, the first time I learned that it was a game changer for me. I was like, ooh, that sounds even better. <laughs> yeah, and, and white vermouth is, is a white wine based aperitif, but still has botanicals added to it. So you have, you know, when you think about that, botanicals and butter and all of that, that's why it's a mother sauce, so. Standing. Great. We should start looking into like doing a little cooking while we do this. Oh yeah. <laughs> now I'm super hungry. It's this guy, right. this guy wants to be eating constantly. Like <laughs> after his first bite of food, he's talking about the next meal. Uh, game plan. <laughs> uh, so you said a few years, like six years ago, Heaven Hill retooled the recipe. Is that is that the time frame right? About then, yeah. Okay. And you were a part of that team, correct? I was. So how did, how does a gal from Chicago <laughs> get, get to retool uh, a French aperitif recipe for Kentucky company? 
Uh, oh my gosh, I think you just said it all in that one sentence. <laughs> and actually, where that conversation started was on the hillside of Jalisco, Mexico. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why not? Um, as I mentioned, like when we started, I was a huge history buff and I love history. Like, I'm just like, I'm so geeky about history, I can't even explain it to y'all. But I love history and I love reading about everything. And I, my degree was in theater and I was a professional actor, but I never stopped learning about people and things because that also fed into me as an actor. Um, but I made my money working in restaurants and bars. And so I brought that love into restaurants and bars. I'm like, well, if this is where I'm making my money, I'm going to learn all that I can learn about it, you know? And um, DuVernay, historically, because it's got such a phenomenal story behind it, it literally was created as medicine for the French Foreign Legion, I thought was phenomenal. And I had an injury where I literally shook my tendon off. And I was like, okay, I can't bartend 24-7 anymore. I've got to figure out how I can be in this industry. And that led me to have an ill into an educator position but that love of history never left and when i joined the team at heaven hill when i became a member of the family what was so exciting was i realized oh my gosh the domestic formula of duvenet is part of the heaven hill portfolio and i got geeky because from a history sense i was like this is such a historic brand and what was interesting was learning about why there were two different recipes and there still are two different recipes. There's a European recipe and there's a domestic recipe. Pernod Ricard owns the rights to the, the European recipe. Heaven Hill owns the rights to the domestic recipe, but they're very much in line. And it happened, as I was mentioning earlier about um, what was happening in the 1940s and um, a Nazi occupation of the United States. And the family, DuVernay was successful everywhere around the world, but not here in the United States. And they wanted to bring it to the United States, but they couldn't bring it to the United States because there was a ban on all French goods at that moment because of Nazi occupation. So what the family did was they came to the United States and they created as close as they could, a unique formula for a domestic version of Duvernay. Obviously the differences are gonna be the wine, not French wine, but California wine, but they brought in many botanicals and that brand changed hands throughout the last part of the century a couple of times and ended up in Heaven Hill's hands in the 19, uh, early 1990s and things have happened to the brand you know high fructose corn syrup and artificial flavors and all of that so when i joined the company seven years ago and i discovered that we had this great historic brand i started screaming like from like the rooftops like can we bring it back to its roots? Can we bring it back to its roots? And that's one of the most amazing things about working for an independent family company is that you actually get your voice heard. And they're like, okay, let's look at this. And so we spent about two years doing a lot of research, doing some, um, you know, getting European samples, you know, and, and, and doing reverse engineering and I got to be part of the whole, like, I'm identifying this, this is what's missing in the domestic, all of that. And eventually, three years ago, we relaunched DuVernay, a new formula, a domestic formula. I got to work with the team on that. I'm so proud of this project because it's very personal to me because it's history, it's flavor, it's bartending, it's everything combined. Um, we brought in new botanicals, we increased the amount of chinchilla, we changed the sugar from high fructose corn syrup to pure cane sugar, so it's 100% natural. We 
uh, increase the ABV because we thought with cocktails, the way America drinks, that a higher alcohol base would um, translate better. We brought in things like black currant and black tea because when we deconstructed and reconstructed, those were flavors that we tasted. And one of the most unique botanicals that we brought in was carrot. Um, because when I kept tasting the original European flavors, I kept getting this crazy root flavor and I couldn't pin my, you know, I couldn't, I just couldn't pinpoint what it was. And um, the team that I work with at our company that develops flavors, well, like we think it's carrot and we put it in. So there's carrot extract in there now, which wasn't in the previous domestic formula. So we own the rights to the domestic formula and Pernod Ricard owns the rights to the European formula. Neat, yeah, yeah. like carrot tops are a popular flavoring ingredient. Did you use carrots or just the tops? Carrots, so carrot extract, so the root, because it was like sweet root flavor. There was like a unique sweet root flavor that honestly took us about six months to figure out and it was <laughs> Now for those ingredients, are you getting those Locally, I mean by locally, I mean within the U.S. or are you outsourcing? We're getting them within the U.S. So our recipe is made in the U.S. We're getting all of our ingredients within the U.S. That is um, the trade laws that were created and the distinction between the two formulas. Um, so there's still the European formula, which is different than the formula that we use, but they're more in line with each other and the European formula is more in line with the original formula and we're more in line with that formula, but we support each other because there's still those existing trade laws. So we can't export, they can't import. Um, so it's just, it, it makes sense that we're in line with each other. Thank you. Nice. That, that's, that's, a, that's like a really interesting tale as far as how the backstory of a product and we, I always liked it because of its story, Duvernay, uh, and it's a historic product. And when you all retooled it, I, I did notice the, the ABV go up and I was kind of curious as to why, but I guess <laughs> you just spelled that out for us. I mean, it makes sense in American culture, we're gonna use it more for a cocktail. In European culture, it's gonna be more as an aperitif. So if you're mixing in a cocktail, you wanna hire ABV so it stands up when you're mixing with it, so. So is the European one still lower than this? Yes, it's at, I think it's at 14 ABV and we're at 19 ABV, so. Okay, cool. Um, I'm just looking at my list of questions and it seems like you, you really knocked a lot of them out of the park already. So, <laughs> uh, so I guess enough talking and maybe we should have a cocktail. Yep, it's uh, time for, for number two. This is a, a drink we call Red Rye. <laughs> That we'd already done before. And uh, just to, to prove that we do like Duvernay, we, this is an old cocktail from our previous list. I'm going to make it with you, so. Perfect. Luke, you want to walk us through this? Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to go with uh, three dashes per drink of uh, Peixot. We're going to add a quarter ounce of strawberry syrup. He just did this off camera, but always either tilt it over or shake it a little bit because it's made with actual strawberries. So it's made with real stuff. It can separate. Natural things like to separate a little bit. All right, we're going to go a half ounce of Dubonnet per drink. Now, we didn't really stress this in the last drink, but we used Elijah Craig, which is also a Heaven Hill product. And now... Yeah. We're about to reach for Rittenhouse, uh, which is probably the cocktail bar working horse rye. Um, like, it oh, doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can, I'm sure the folks at- I can't keep this in stock in my own house, so. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so we're gonna go two ounces per drink. So a bit of a big drink. This is a stirred cocktail again. Everybody's home. Nobody's driving. 
Nice little syrup. Uh, it smells so good. I love the syrups. They're amazing. Glad, glad you enjoy them. We're really excited about like ones like strawberry, uh, where if you look at the back, the ingredients are listed: strawberries, sugar, water. It's um, real complicated recipes, uh, but as it turns out, nothing tastes more like strawberries than strawberries. So, uh, it's hard, it's hard right. that yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Let me get out of the way here. Oh, Lynn is not that's messing around here. Okay. I know how to mix a fast cocktail, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I love how the rye interacts with the strawberry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you think of like pepper notes and strawberry. Mm -hmm. and you just know it's going to work. So, that's, um, so we just mentioned Rittenhouse being uh, kind of a workhorse of cocktail bars internationally. And neither of us can keep it uh, on, on the home bar. <laughs> Could you tell, like, for folks listening to this now or later, uh, a little bit about the brand Rittenhouse, which is also not originally from, from Kentucky. Absolutely. So Rittenhouse checks a lot of boxes. It's a rye whiskey. So when you think in comparison to bourbon, it has to be at least 51% rye. So bourbon has to be 51% corn. And when you're understanding the different flavor variantials, it's like bread. Cornbread is sweet and buttery. Rye bread is spicy and bold and herbaceous. So you already know by being a rye whiskey and having 51% rye as part of the mash bill that it's gonna be bold, herbaceous, a little oily, a little, you know, um, and spicy with that. So that's definitely Rittenhouse. But where Rittenhouse is unique in a couple of ways. Number one, it's a Pennsylvania style rye. So when you think about rye, you think Pennsylvania, you think Maryland. And what those ryes had in um, consistent with themselves was they had a lot of corn in there. So we actually have 35% corn in this mash bill, which is going to bring some roundness, some sweetness, some butteriness to it. But Rittenhouse is a bottled and bond rye. And that's really important. I'll show the bottle right here if everyone can see it. And you'll see bottle and bond and there's a tax stamp that's on here on top. So bottle and bond was um, a congressional act that was enacted in 1897. And it was the first time in the United States that we put forth um, consumer protections on a consumable. If you wanna think about it in perspective, we were making rules on the integrity of our spirits in 1897. The Food and Drug Act doesn't come out to 1906. So it was almost 10 years later that we actually started to pay attention to our food and our drugs that we were, you know, ingesting. So what was happening in the country was a lot of bad things were happening. Things like tobacco and iodine and methyl alcohol was being left behind in it. And so essentially the bottle and bond hack said that you had to age a spirit for four years. That's the ideal time of aging at one location. So if you look on the back of Rittenhouse, you'll see a DSP number that tells you what distillery made it. Um, so you weren't buying somebody's old juice or whatever. There was actually a chain of integrity. Um, it had to be, um, all the grains or everything botanicals because you can make brandy on, on the bottle and bond act from one year so it could be using something that had been sitting in your cellars for years and years and years it had to be within that growing season and it had to be um, 100 proof and 
you couldn't add anything. You couldn't put like the tobacco, the iodine, um, added methyl alcohol. You couldn't add all these artificial ingredients that really challenged the integrity of the base spirit. And so Rittenhouse is one of like, I think three bottle and bond ryes that are available out there. So it's a rye base, so it's gonna be spicy, a little oily, a little herbaceous, it's 100 proof, it's four years age, the price is great, and it's a great go-to for cocktails. Well, one thing I love about the Heaven Hill uh, portfolio and the folks that work for Heaven Hill is your, your bottle and bond enthusiasm. Like clearly it's, it's evident with what, how you're talking about it, but we just had Bernie on the, on this uh, podcast a few weeks back. And as you know, uh, Bernie Lovers He's a bottle and bond king because that's his tattoo on his arms. <laughs> like he's, he's definitely into it. Uh, stay bonded, I think is how he signs everything. And it's, so, it's stay bonded, but that's one of the things that's been amazing about Heaven Hill just as a company and as a family. They've really worked hard to preserve heritage brands and heritage lineage within our spirits industry. And Bottle and Bond is one of those. We still, out of the country, there's more and more, you know, different producers coming on and making Bottle and Bonds, which is great because it adds to people understanding this category. But we still produce about, I would say, 65% of the Bottle and Bonds that are available out there. And Rent House Rye is an anchor for us. So. How many bonded warehouses do y'all have? So, um, if you get, well, that's an interesting question. Um, we have at the moment um, in Louisville about 58, 59 brick houses that are up and working, oh, wow. um, which have about 1.7 million barrels of the aging, you know, whiskey aging in them. But we also, we, we make Christian Brothers, so there's Sacred Bond, which is our bottle and bond brandy, and of course Christian Brothers, that's all produced in California, and that's a bonded warehouse as well. Um, you know, and then now that we own Black Velvet, um, we've got all that whiskey aging, those aren't bonded because bonded is exclusively a United States um, uh, regulation, so we can't do bonded outside. We can do, we can apply the same principles outside, but we can't. We have a distillery in Ireland, distillery in, in um, Mexico, distillery in Canada, California, but um, Kentucky is our base. So, what's your distillery in Ireland? Uh, so we own Carillons okay. and Irish Mist. Uh, that's in the last four or five years. So we have that distillery out there. So we make Carillons, Irish cream, and we've got the traditional, we've got salted caramel. Uh, we are in the process of launching cold, uh, cold brew, which is delicious. And then Irish mist is a part of that um, distillery as well. Good days with Irish mist. I remember that. <laughs> Irish Mist has been a while, around for a while. It's been around for about 40, 50 years. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my grandparents had Irish Mist in the, in the crystal decanter. Like it, was, like it was their special thing. They didn't even have it in the bottle anymore. They transferred it to the really fancy decanter. Oh, uh, super like, special because it was like, it was, it's, you know, when you look at the actual recipe of Irish Mist, it's amazing. It's Irish whiskey, it's honey, it's heather. You know, it's, it's delicious. It, it um just in, you know and uh what's the word i'm thinking encapsulates um everything about ireland the heather the citrus the salt the whiskey yeah cool. uh, question i had well maybe we can just pivot a little bit here uh we, we like i said we had connor which is your distiller and 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 bernie the brand ambassador on a couple weeks ago we you know, peppered them with distillery questions. Uh, so one of the reasons we're very excited to have you on is because you have a very different background than them. Um, I'm cocktail girl. So yeah. <laughs> exactly, and, and we make cocktails on we make cocktails on every one of these except for the one with Connor uh, and Bernie. We just tasted whiskey. <laughs> they they weren't doing it. I was like, okay, okay. 
Um, Christian, so, Christian, we have our different specialties. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah <laughs> lean into lean into your strengths. So, speaking of your strengths, uh, you you you've been um, associated with some really important bars, uh, and you have you're known in the industry as someone the kind of a go-to person when talking about like these um, contests, right? Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me how you transition from like bartender to competition uh, kind of guru? Oh my gosh, that was, that's a crazy story. So I, when I got into bars was about, I've been in the restaurant industry since I was in high school. Um, you know, I worked, a little, you know, restaurant job in high school, in college, I worked this bar that was called Attractions. Yes, that was the name. It was the 80s, that's how old I am. Um, but it was called Attractions, it was like Nagel artwork, was like the artwork for it. Um, and those friends I made there are still my friends. That's the one thing I, I always tell people that working in a bar is like working in the priesthood, like there's a certain sector of people that gravitate towards that. And you guys should stick together because we know we're a little outside of the norm. And so I started working in bars and restaurants in college and that's part of how I paid my way to college. And then when I graduated from college, that was hard, part of how I continued to pay my way through life. Um, so my degrees in theater, so I was a professional actor well, I acted, but in between gigs, I still bartended and I still worked in restaurants and such. I worked for Houston's for five years and ended up becoming a corporate trainer for them um, because the theater aspect meant that I was, it was easy for me to talk in front of people, which paid well off for them. And then when I left Houston's, I went on to work for um, uh, uh, the, company here. I went to Maggiano's um, and I went to, uh, it was less entertaining. That's the company I'm thinking of. So I went to work for Maggiano, right? which is a huge company in the country. And I worked at Maggiano's for three years. And I worked at Joe's Stone Crab with them for a year. And I became a trainer with, in both those restaurants because I understood food. I love food. I love drinks. I love wine. And I kept um, educating myself along the way. Um, eventually, I left that in between doing acting gigs. So that was the whole thing about theater. But eventually, I would leave that and I would go to um, get a job as the one of the original master bartenders at the drawing room, which is huge. Because the drawing room, along with Violet Hour, were the first two craft cocktail bars in the city of Chicago and Chicago, like New York and San Francisco, were the harbingers of the craft cocktail movement. So I went to work at this bar. Um, I, I studied, um, I studied about wine, beer, spirits, all the kind of sorts. So I got the job and I got to help develop my first menu ever. And my first cocktail that I did, which was a tequila cocktail, was picked up by local papers. My second cocktail I did, which was called Almost um, Summer, was picked up nationally by Forbes magazine. And that was really kind of the birth of my career. Suddenly I had Forbes magazine taking my picture and showing my cocktail. And I didn't even know that they had been in drinking, but they loved the cocktail and that leaped onto the national scene. Um, I left there and went to work for Graham Elliott, who went on to be on, you know, with, um, working with Gordon Ramsay. Um, I ran his beverage program for two years and I kept getting picked up. And then I just started competing naturally because I wanted, I was getting a taste of stuff and I wanted more and I learned a lot through competition. I learned how to fine tune my flavors. I learned how to find my voice. I became much more confident. My first competition was a Hennessy competition and I didn't win. And I absolutely hated losing that competition. And I vowed never to lose another competition again. And I never did. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was just like, I hate this feeling. I'm never going to lose it. I'm going to figure this out. And it was about fine tuning flavors. It was about kind of censoring myself and, you know, being more focused. It was about being more thoughtful. It was about having intention behind everything that I did. So if I created a cocktail and had a flavor, a name, a story, it all had intention behind it. And I never, um, I'll be honest, I never lost a cocktail competition after that, so. Okay, wow. When you say censoring yourself, what mm -hmm. do you mean by that? Like editing myself, like, you know, if you were um, a bartender, part of the craft cocktail movement, like 15 years ago, like we put 50 ingredients into a cocktail to create a great cocktail. And I was just like, I have to edit myself and censor myself and really understand what is the intention of this drink and focus those flavors. And so I learned to become like five ingredient, three to five ingredient girl. Um, I put a personal, I still put a personal touch into it that I drew a lot of what I put in or made my syrups or made my tonics, all those things. So that was my personal self coming in, but I had to edit myself down and not be fussy. At the end of the day, someone's had a rough day and they want to drink a great cocktail. They don't want to, you know, read War and Peace while they're drinking a cocktail. So. I've uh, given this advice to, to bartenders who've worked here before. I'm like, if you're wondering, you got like six ingredients in the drink and you're wondering mm -hmm. like what else you could do to this drink. The answer is like, try to figure out what you can take out. <laughs> exactly. So you want to think about a drink like this. So think about, and I, and I come from a wine background because I worked fine dining for so long. So I also think about a great cocktail. I can think about a great glass of wine and what makes wine, a great glass of wine great is front flavor, residual flavor, acid, tannin, and something tickling me in the middle. And so a cocktail, to me, in my opinion, and that's been my opinion about creating cocktails, it should be that. A front flavor, a back flavor, which is your residual flavor, something tickling in the middle, a little acid, whatever. It shouldn't be just sweet. It shouldn't be just tannin. It shouldn't just be alcoholic. It shouldn't just be, you know, spicy. You want everything, you want every single time someone to take a sip to get something new into that. And that's what makes a great cocktail. And I think that sometimes we aren't so great in this industry about making that translate. But if you think about a cocktail as a great glass of wine and how you want a great glass of wine to tell a story, a cocktail you think about it, if it's sitting in front of you for 20, 30 minutes, it should tell a story. It yeah. all comes down to purpose. Exactly. You know, a great glass of wine is supposed to um, bring, like you back. bring you back to the glass, right? It's like you put it down and you're like, hmm, that was interesting. I want a little more of that. And a cocktail should do that as well. There's no reason why a great cocktail shouldn't do that either, you know? So I couldn't agree more. Right. I think that's really well, really well said. I have, I, it's really funny as you're telling me your story. I, I have a lot of the same story. <laughs> so like, it's like, oh, interesting. This works. Well, I'll tell you guys a little something crazy. So particularly when I ran the beverage program at Blackbird and I was developing a cocktail menu, my staff would laugh at me because they would come in and I would have 10 cocktails lined up in the bar. And they knew, okay, she's working on a new menu. And they're like, what's going on? And I was like, this is the same cocktail at five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and so on. I wanted to taste the evolution of the story of that cocktail. And where it landed at 30 minutes, let me know if it was a winner or not. Not where it was at five minutes, you're going to always make someone happy up front, but where is it going to be? I'm like, I'm like, the reality is the people who are sitting at my tables or sitting at my bar are going to be sipping over this cocktail for a period of 10 to 30 minutes, depending upon your situation. 
So I needed it to be a great cocktail at five to 10 minutes, and I needed it to be a great cocktail at 25 to 30 minutes. And I would sit there and I did that with absolutely every single cocktail I put on my menu. I had different time frames and time stamps and would go back and taste and see how those flavors would evolve. And if it was a great cocktail at five minutes, but a crappy cocktail at 30 minutes, it didn't go on my menu. Since we're talking about cocktails and everything, uh, is there any update on the cocktail competition that you guys run? Is Given COVID and everything, are you going to be doing it virtually? What is, uh, what? Yes, so um, that launch date will be in about a week. Um, we are doing the Bartender of the Year, the Heaven Hill Bartender of the Year competition again this year. It's going to be dramatically different. We're actually going to do it in four tracks and offer the opportunity for four different winners at $5,000 each. Um, that's going to be launched very, very soon. We'll make sure that Dawson and Amanda and everyone and Claire and Luke have that information to shuttle that out, but we're not going to be doing it in the traditional, uh, make a cocktail, set a recipe. We're actually centering around four different themes that we think will help make bartenders stronger and they'll be workshops and seminars involved. So you don't have to pay any money. You just get to sign up and be a part and learn from Jackie Summers and Claire Sprouse and Jeffrey Morgenthaler and Joaquin Simone and some other people, Lauren Taylor, Alex Jump that we're bringing in. Um, so there's gonna still be a competition, but it's gonna be very, very different this year. This is still a very, very different year. And we hear that. We want to support the community, and we think doing a traditional bartending competition is just not the right thing to do. So, so you said about a week or so, did you say? Um, I, you'll see this week there will be an announcement made. So, <laughs> uh, that comes with the PR team, which is not me. Um, we're partnering again with liquor.com. Um, so they will be talking about what the process looks like. But there's going to be seminars open to everybody and workshops open and mentorship and mentorship is going to be a part of what the final prize is. So. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to do like make your best cocktail. There's so much more going on in the industry right now. Um, outside of making cocktails, we're trying like, how do we keep our businesses afloat? How do we yeah. promote you know, diversity and inclusion? How do we become more sustainable? This has definitely been a year of a lot of conversation, which is great in the industry. And so what we're gonna do this year with the Heaven Hill Bartender of the Year competition is gonna reflect that. You'll see something within this week, so. Cool, that sounds excellent. I'm excited. I'm very excited. There's a couple of things more from an IT st stance that are being tweaked, but I'm very excited. So we've got great mentors lined up and part of, part of the winning formula is going to be partnership with a great mentor. So that sounds that very great. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Hey, so you said that first cocktail you did was with tequila, correct? Uh, the, 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 well, the first cocktail I, I did was the dandy, but I do have a tequila cocktail. No, no, no. A one on your, so you said you, you put your first cocktail on that menu and it was a tequila cocktail. This is when you were telling us about your, you know, your backstory. Oh, my backstory. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I was being a little confused there. Um, one of the first cocktails I did was, was a tequila cocktail at, that was when I was at the drawing room and it, um, the sto I told a story with the cocktail. The story was very organic for me and I was pulling from flavors of my own personal heritage. I'm multi-ethnic, so I was pulling from all those flavors and that cocktail just became very successful. I didn't expect it to be quite the success that it was. Well, I really loved the drawing room cocktail. I got a chance to visit uh, Chicago right 
did that first year that both the drawing room and violet hour were open i got to visit both of those, those oh days. awesome i was there at that time so i was part of the opening team well there were, so there were some really great drinks and it was really inspiring stuff because i hadn't quite opened i haven't quite opened alley 26 yet so i was learning from y'all and learning from folks in new york and going around and, and kind of getting an idea of the kind of places and i know i wasn't the only one because now you can't go in any town in america without a cocktail bar so you know we all owe you guys a debt but speaking of tequila cocktails i think you got one that you you gave us the rest before we'd like to go ahead and make that one absolutely so this is happy thieves um again i'm always um a proponent for telling a story and a name should involve the story because you know particularly as a bar you're like why is it called this you know they're like there's a reason so this is called happy thieves because i'm thieving from two different cocktails i'm thieving from a julep and i'm thieving from a mule um but i'm incorporating amazing amazing syrups that you know um ally 26 has created so i'm gonna get my tin right here and in my tin i'm going to put i've got the blackberry syrup which is delicious i'm gonna put an ounce of that in there in my tin i really like these syrups because they're like super fresh um easy to mix easy to bulk up with if you were doing an event or something like that and then i'm going to take the juice of half a lime so half ounce of lime juice push this in here and then i'm going to take my lunazol tequila so this is a lowland uh jalisco 100 percent blue agave tequila we actually make this in um, cognac stills. We double distill it in cognac stills. So I'm going to pour two ounces in there. And we were talking earlier about balance in a cocktail and sweet, salt, not getting everything. I think one of the things, because there's a lot of salinity um, that goes with agave. And so I think in, even when you're making just like a classic margarita, you always want to add a couple of drops of some saline solution. So this is a one-to-one -one saline the solution. So equal parts salt and water. Put three drops in there. Now, let me ask, uh, when, when you say one-to-one, -one, are you going by volume or weight? I'm going by volume. By volume. Thank you. I did, I did the same. I've also been told we were having a little bit of audio problems. So if at any point we seem like we're yelling, we're just trying to make sure you can hear us. <laughs> I haven't felt that, but I go by volume. Um, okay. You bake, that's how you cook. When, when you're thinking about dry ingredients to liquid ingredients, I just go by volume. So I do equal parts and making sure that I'm doing by volume with that. And I've got the lime, the tequila, the blackberry, the saline. I'm gonna add some ice, give it a nice shake. You always want to shake when you're using non-alcoholic ingredients that help the emulsifying process. Ooh, opa. And then I'm going to fill my, I've got a little pretty Collins glass right here with some ice. Like I said, I borrowed from a margarita, a julep, and a Moscow meal. That's why it's called Happy Thieves. So that meal part is going to just be ginger beer and float that on top. Ginger and blackberry and that little bit of salt goes really nicely together. Give it a stir. And then I'm known as a garden girl, so I've got some fresh mint in my garden. And there's happy thieves, it appears. 
Yeah, I hear it's like 68 degrees there today. But it's nice because you get the citrus, the tequila, the berry, the ginger. And that saline solution is really important. I think um, people don't recognize how important salt can be in a cocktail. So. Right. so I was speaking to my sister earlier on the phone today. She's in Chicago. Uh, oh, she was okay. over the moon about the weather you're having right now. So I uh, guess today is beautiful. The doing today, well. not, but today is beautiful. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Garden Girl in Chicago. Uh, do you have uh, do you have uh, blue lights or something? <laughs> How do you grow those herbs? Um, so I have herbs growing on the back porch because I can control that. And then, um, I have gooseberries that are actually fruiting and got a little cold, so I threw a blanket over them. Um, I treat them like babies, and then this weekend, as the soil is getting warm, I'm going to put in tomatoes and peppers and all that stuff, so. I come from a family of gardeners. My family is from Kentucky and Tennessee, so I understand earth, soil, and seeds. <laughs> this is delicious. Yeah. I can really, I, I get what you're saying, where those influences, they come through. Yeah, and that little bit of salt is nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's um, I couldn't agree more. A lot of people underestimate what a little salt can do. Sometimes when we're doing skirt cocktails here, especially with gin cocktails, uh, we'll we'll put a an olive in. Well, honestly, for the salt. <laughs> right, that, that salt just it creates a little texture and salinity, and it actually. I think it personally works as a binder for all the ingredients that you're working with, particularly when you're bringing fruit. So spirits like gin, spirits like tequila, you know, I mean, that's why everyone loves a dirty martini. It's that salt, you know, it gives texture and, and some dimensionality to that cocktail. And so don't be afraid of, if you're working and you're crafting a cocktail and you're like, it feels empty in the middle. I can't figure out what's missing. And you're like, add more syrup, add more botanicals, add more herbs. Sometimes just try adding a couple of drops of, you know, saline solution, a homemade saline solution into it. And you'll be surprised what that does to that cocktail. It's, it's, it's very, it's something that people don't think of, but they wouldn't think of making food without salt. And exactly. It's, it's a flavor enhancer the same way. It's, it's the same way. Honestly, I was crafting this recipe looking how to work with the blackberry, you know, syrup. And I knew I wanted to do a tequila drink and I kept drinking it. I was like, it's flat, it's flat. And I was like, let's try a couple of drops of saline solution. And I put it in, I'm like, just three drops. It just changed it completely. It gave texture. It brought all the ingredients together and it also amped up the blackberry and amped up the ginger and amped up the tequila. You know, like you said, it's the same thing with a plate of food, a little salt, a little pepper, their accents. For us, it's still bitter acid, but it's also salt, so. Definitely, yeah. So, Buda is one of the Heaven Hills products. That's the distillery you talked about in Mexico, correct? Yes, so Luna Zool, um, this is a partnership between us and the Beckman family. The Beckman family um, was known best for Cuervo. Um, and they had a split about three decades ago. The one brother kept the brand Cuervo. The other brother was like, kept the fields. So this is a single estate. Um, he still sells the agave to his brother and to other brands, but this is a single estate, lowland, um, Jalisco tequila, what you need to know about that, what that means as far as tequila is concerned, is that the lowlands is volcanic soil, so it's more mineral. Highlands are clay soil, so it's more fruit forward. So this is a lowland, so that's why if you taste Linus Wool straight on its own, you're gonna get green peppercorn notes, pink peppercorn notes, you're gonna get ripe pineapple. And the way we, um, extract the flavor is through steam autoclave. 
So the agave is harvested and it's steamed at 225 degrees for 25 hours. So essentially like cooking a pot roast. Um, I ask how big those auto plates are. I'm sorry? How big are the, the auto plates that you're using? Like how many uh, they vary. They're, I would say an average of about 50 pounds. We harvest when ripe, which tends to be about six years in age. So before it flowers, because once it's flowered, you're losing the sugar in the agave. So you have, you're you harvesting between five to six years. Um, and they are huge. I can send you pictures of me trying to hold one and falling over. Um, but they're about 50 pounds. What we do is we split them in half and they go into a steam autoclave for 25 hours at 225 degrees. And it literally goes in like this huge pina and comes out like this small pot roast. Um, and what that has allowed to do is all of the sugars to naturally caramelize. And then we um, put it into, we have a proprietary yeast and we put it into um, copper pot stills or cognac stills. It gets double distilled. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's our own handprint on it. I can't even speak to the integrity as to how this peel is made. We do a deep cut of heads and tails because we really want the cores on the heart of it. And then those heads and tails go back into future distillations. Are you using a combination of uh, Tahona and Roller Mill? Uh, say that again, please. Are you using a combination of Tahona and Roller Mill or using one or the so other? We do not do Tahona method. What we do is once it's come out of the steam autoclave, it actually goes through this kind of um, unique sense of water jet propulsion. So it's, the water is, and it's local water, and one of the reasons where our distillery is where it is, we're at the base of a, a mountain. So we're actually, we have the rights the exclusive rights to that mountain water. We're not using city water. And so the water is being used to separate the pulque, so the pulp from the strands. Um, so we're not doing Tahona. What we're doing is, because Tahona is a whole completely different system. Uh, what we're doing is steam autoclave. So we're cooking the agave first and then separating the ripe agave from the fibers and then using that pulque and injecting the yeast in there and letting that um, ferment for about five to six days, depending upon how much sugar is in there. And then that's what is the product that goes into our, our cognac stills. Thank you. So what's the difference between um, a regular tequila still and a cognac still? And why does that make a difference? So there's different ways of producing tequila. There's, there's something that's known as a diffuser. And what that does is that separates the juice from the pulp of the agave while it's still raw. And you can do it young and you can get a high volume of juice that you can then inject with the yeast and start fermentation and then distill afterwards. So that's a huge, huge, huge high volume weight. But the problem is, is that the agave is often too young and is very green. The Tahona method is ancient and that's using these huge kind of wheel stones. And when you're, and you get great tequilas from that, Fortaleza is done in a Tahona method. Um, the problem is you just can't get high volume. And what we do is, kind of in between, it's, it's a steam autoclave. So instead of grinding raw pinas, which when you are making tequila, you're making it from the pina, which is the root of the agave. So instead of making tequila from raw pinas, what we do is we harvest the pinas and we cook them. So we steam them. We steam them for a, a long time, like I said, 25 hours. 225 degrees. It's literally like making a pot roast. So it's like taking something kind of rough and turning it into something tender. And that allows a uh, natural caramelization of sugars 
So we don't add any caramel, we don't add any sugar. You're allowed to do that in, in the laws of tequila, but we don't do that. And so the method that we use allows us to steam, enhance the sugars naturally, then add the yeast, ferment it, then distill it, and then cut it with water. So we're not adding anything. We're literally just depending upon the plant. So what we do since we own our agave is we keep the agave that has the highest amounts of sugar for ourselves and we sell the lesser amounts to other companies. So, uh, so her question specifically was about stills. So, so still, like, still I guess, so what we do is you can do, I mean, there's so many different stills. You can do a continuation still. The stills that we just happen to use are cognac stills. So they are copper stills. So it's pot stills. So there's a little more, um, I guess what I want to say, there's just a little more interaction from the distiller than putting something in a column still than you do with a pot still. And what we do is we do a double pot still. So we put it in the still, we double distill it two times, but we're using copper pot cognac stills, which in the world of distillation are just considered some of the most premium stills that you can work with. You end up getting more of the like oils and other stuff still intact, right? Okay. Right. You're not losing. You're not losing congeners and aromatics and aldehydes and all that. You have much more of that in the end product, so much more natural flavor than you do if you do a column still. So you said this is a comp. Uh, the Luna Soul is a um, is a joint venture, right? Correct. Uh, so, Blanco is not really aged in barrels, but Reposado and especially Añejo is. So, are you, are they, are you sourcing the barrels from Kentucky? <laughs> so, uh, for, for our brand, um, Blanco by definition is aged three months in a nun, in a, in a essentially a neutral container. That's why it stays clear and white. And Yeho and uh, well, Reposado and Yeho and Extra and Yeho have um, definite legal uh, definitions with that. Because it's a partnership between us and the Beckman family, everything is used in Heaven Hill whiskey barrels. So when you're making bourbon, y'all need to know that we can only use that bourbon one, that barrel one time to make bourbon. So what do we do with all those barrels? <laughs> Everyone's like, what do you do with those barrels? Well, you have, we have other products that we make. We sell some of our products to Scotland, to Sherry, to different countries and stuff. But we use a lot of those barrels to make other aged products that we can reuse that barrel. So if you're looking at the uh, Reposado and Linozul, that's been aged for six months in used Evan Williams barrels. If you're looking at the Añejo, that's been aged for 18 months in used bourbon barrels, which are Heaven Hill barrels. And then we have extra age and some double finishes and some one-off things that we do. So part of what we do with our, reuse, our barrels that have been already used for bourbon is we do ship them to um, Mexico and they're used to make the aged spirits with Lunazole. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my, my mic went out. I was like, excellent. And Claire's like, you're muted. <laughs> okay, <all right. laughs> uh, So you were, in 2011, uh, of the, the list of the top 20 most fabulous bartenders in the world compiled by very, very missed uh, Gaz Regan. I mentioned you, put you on that list. Did you ever get a chance to meet Gaz Regan? Um, Gaz is, well, was, I still say is because he lives in my heart, a fellow Virgo. I'm a Virgo. I'm a true Virgo, and he was a Virgo. And I got to have many opportunities with Gaz. 
Um, ironically, when I was put on that list, he and I had not met yet. Um, it was simply by the work that I was doing here in Chicago and I somehow caught his eye, which is, I still to this day don't even understand how that happened. Like, that's an amazing thing to me, but I guess things that I was doing through competitions and uh, TV shows and such. And I have to say that Gaz was such a proponent of promoting people that were part of underserved communities. And obviously y'all can see me, I'm a black woman. So as part of an underserved community in general, but particularly in this industry and gas was just like, you're out there and you don't apologize. And our first meeting was part of Bar Smart, which he was part of the original team for. And Chicago was one of the original launch um, sites for that and we got to meet and we sat way top for an hour and it was phenomenal and he's like I'm putting you in this book because he's like I just think you're and I I'm like I've looked up to you for so long I don't even know why you're putting me in this book um I would end up to go and stay with him and his wife at their house on vacations and stuff like that we had an amazing friendship um, but it, it really just came out of mutual respect for representing positivity in the industry. So I'm grateful. I miss him tremendously, but yeah. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, do you have like one story that kind of in indicates like the rapport? Like you said you got to hang a number of times. <laughs> is, there, is there, cause, cause he was a funny fellow. He was a really <laughs> funny fellow. Oh my God, and, and I still stay in touch with this widow all the time. So um, I guess probably one of the funniest was um, when I did Cocktails in the Country and it was, I had left bartending world and came over to the brand side and you know, he had this great kind of summer camp that was called Cocktails in the Country. And it was amazing. You had to apply and all those things. And obviously he got brands to sponsor and we sponsored through Elijah Craig. And, but he never allowed sponsors to come because he's like, I don't want it to be like a sponsorship messaging thing. And I was like, yes, I want to come. We're sponsoring, I want to come. He's like, all right, I don't allow sponsors to come, but you can come because we just had this great love for each other and a really great mutual, you know, in fact, when Heaven Hill hired me, he wrote the owners of Heaven Hill, and I've got a copy of the letter, like, I'm gonna cry right now, <laughs> but he was just like, he's like, you guys just did the most amazing thing, and you hired an amazing person, and all of this, and I had no idea that he had done this. I didn't even know for like three years after working for Heaven Hill that Yaz had sent this letter, like, this is the best thing you could have done, so it's, it's so personal to me. But I was like, hey guys, I wanna come. I'm like, I just wanna see, I'm not gonna like brand talk or anything. We just, I just wanna know more about what you're doing. And I'm excited about what we're doing because he talked about mindfulness. And he's like, well, you're gonna have to attend as a student. I'm like, I'm completely fine with that. And he's like, but you can't stay at the place because you know, that's been sponsored. He's like, so you'll just stay with me and my wife. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, that's horrible. Um, and he picked me up and we, I attended like a student, which was great. And I just watched like a student, not like a sponsor and to listen to his messaging about mindfulness and being conscientious of what you do and being um, um, intactful for what you do. And like, just always having reason and understanding reason and is it a good reason or a bad reason and all of that was amazing and then at the end of the day people were like where are you staying i'm like i'm staying with gaz <laughs> <laughs> and we went back and like they had two giant poodles and we just chilled there may have been some other recreational <laughs> that happened um but we had the best time, and I just like, I remember saying, I'm like, oh my God, I'm with my like idol and icon in his house with his wife, 
beautiful yard, looking at their plants, hanging with their giant poodles, and we're chilling and we're watching like some stupid, scary movie together. And it was just cool and real because that's the thing that you have to remind yourself about everyone. Like no matter where someone is on the pedestal, they're still a real person at the end of the day. So that's my, that's my best memory of Gaz. And we laugh, we trash people. We <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that. Like he's, <laughs> he's clearly an icon. Uh, and like every story you hear about him is always, you know, makes you like him. And, and like people like me wish we met him. Even uh, so. before, he passed not shortly after his birthday, but I was so happy that I got to give him his birthday message. And he was, I knew he was sick. You know, he was honest about that with those who'd become in his inner circle. And I was honored to be within that inner circle. And, you know, you just kept giving positive messages. And like he, I remember wishing him happy birthday. And I think he passed like three or four weeks after that. And, um, but an amazing individual. And we have to remember him and talk about mindfulness being conscientious, making deliberate decisions, thinking about what our, how our decisions affect others, I think is really important in the industry of hospitality. And I'm hoping that Gaz's legacy continues on with that, so. Certainly hope so. And it seems like he was ahead of his time in that regard. There's okay. a lot of conversation about that now, but he was talking about it 15 years ago. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, uh, so I guess we should probably wrap this up pretty soon. We've had you on the phone here for an hour and a half. <laughs> and we have some giveaways. Oh, oh, we like, have a number of giveaways. I miss North Carolina so much. And I love being able to talk to you. And I'm seeing some familiar faces and names up here. So that's super cool. So if anyone has any questions, you just have to help me because I can't really read really well. It's so I'm blind. So I think Claire's the one responding in the chat. So. Questions are being answered. <laughs> okay, cool. But if there are any others that you're like, Lynn, throw out a shout out, whatever, let me know. What was that? Oh, so this is the time of the evening when we give stuff away. Oh, uh, yeah. And this is going to be Heaven Hill branded things. Uh, so there's a whole, there's. So we'll have a couple of packages. We'll there's some shirts. Shirts. You call there's, me old fashioned. There's some mixing glasses. There's some my socks. favorite. Some socks. Oh, the this. socks are great. I oh. know mixing glass that you're using because that's what yeah, I use. Yes, I love this. I use one myself. Um, so we'll put a packages together. So if you win, uh, please uh, let us know what shirt size you are. If you're early enough, because there's a couple of smalls in there. Most of us are not small. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Small. We're never small. That's why Bart, that's why brands never make small <laughs> So, oh, it's crop top. Sorry. It's crop top. Crop top. It's crop top. It's crop top season. Popcorn <laughs> summer. <laughs> this is great. It's great. We're going to show some belly buttons this, this summer. Yeah. Um, no, no. Okay. You. Not not me? No, no, no. Are you sure? No, no, no. We're good. We're good. Okay. We've seen it. What? We saw it years ago. We're good. We're good. <laughs> uh, let's go through a couple questions, though. We do have about five uh, packages for it, so we're going to ask some questions. What was the first year that Dubonnet was originally uh, created? So just respond in the chat. First correct answer in the chat. Wins Patty and Curtis. Always. What'd they say? They said 1846. No. 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 Uh -uh. The original Dubonnet. Mm -hmm. Randy Hartley. Uh, uh, 1846 is Dubonnet. 1630 is is just discovering Chinchona. Oh. oh you said Dubonnet. Oh, you said uh, Dubonnet. Sorry. That's 1846. Okay. So, so Patty Curtis. <laughs> Andy Curtis answered the question that was asked <laughs> rather than the question we thought we were asking. <laughs> like, Dubonnet is a brand, yes. Chinchona, different. So. Well, tomorrow's Whiskey Wednesday, so uh, hopefully, maybe we can talk Patty and Curtis into showing up. 
<laughs> uh, having some whiskey with us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Curtis, get it. All right. So, um, next question. Oh, Curtis, I'm going to save you one of those small t shirts, okay? Uh, she said, now this is a little geeky. Thank but, you so much. <laughs> so, because we want to see your belly button. Uh, so, the, um, it's a little geeky, but it's called Industry Insider Series. So we're asking an industry-specific question. Heaven Hill owns the domestic rights and has the domestic recipe. Who has the international recipe? I said it. Yeah, you, she said it. I heard it oh. multiple times. Randy got it. Randy. Yeah. Randy, there we go. Okay. Okay. Renault well, Ricard. Renault Ricard is the answer, correct. They have a couple of other things uh, that I love. Lynn, do you want to ask a question? Oh, can I ask a question that I didn't say? Yes, oh, sure. All right, here's a really good question. When was Heaven Hill Brands established? What year? Come on, folks. People are just going to take guesses now. Oh, yes. Well, that's carrying out. Yep. 1935. 35. It's Shapiro Carrie family. And Allison. Is that right? Shapiro family, 1935. It was the five Shapiro brothers. That is correct. We are in the third, second and third generation of family ownership. So, Lynn. Yeah. Was that a cutout of Max Shapiro I see back there? It is a cutout of Max Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The call out. The call out. Lynn, would you like to ask, ask another question? <laughs> Good call, Dawson. <laughs> Dig it. Dig it. Lynn, you're, that was a great question. Would you, would you ask another one? Would I ask another one? All right, let me think about it. Um, oh, I got one. So we talked about Lynn Rittenhouse written house, and Elijah Craig. Can someone tell me another spirit that Heaven Hill brand makes? Hopefully, oh, somebody doesn't work for Heaven Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Dawson, I'm eyeballing you. Is James on this call? Oh, <laughs> Stop. he's here. Perfect. <laughs> That is He's correct. Still a rep, though. Who got it? Jake Parker Heritage. Oh, Jeff. Wait, did George get that one? Yes. <laughs> well, Jeff does not work for Heaven Hill, so he technically He gets it. That's great. <laughs> Very knowledgeable. <laughs> Important to know. We make everything, y'all, including like hypnotic. Oh, you guys do hypnotic. Yeah. I got a lot of incredible Hulk stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we never talked about that anniversary. Song, though. So it's interesting, and this is um, if you go back like twenty years, bourbon was not as hip as it is today. Correct. Right. Whiskey's really, a, and so Heaven Hill is a whiskey distillery, certainly, but they did well in the dark ages. Because, you know, Burnett's. They made other stuff. They they, they adapted. Uh, Christian Brothers. Um, uh, the, 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 the rum. <laughs> I'm like Blackheart, Admiral Nelson, Hypnotic, Hama. Canton. Okay. So one more question. One more. Lynn, you can do it or we can do it? You guys do it. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah. there's this. You want to go? I, uh, I was going to ask when we were talking about building a cocktail as far as, uh, as far as Lynn's recommendations for cocktail competition, how many ingredients does it include? Ooh. Ooh, yeah. What range of in no, ingredient number? Oh, that's good. What range of ingredients should the cocktail be? Yeah. Cheryl. Three Cheryl? Five. Three oh. five. 
Three to five. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Whoop. Excellent. I was going to add, what was the main component of DuVernay? That was going to be my question. Oh, uh, uh, I just want to know if everyone can answer that. What? Who just, who just called? <laughs> ring, ring. Not ring. Right. I know. Nope. Oh, come on, everybody. Wine. Jesus. Donna Bart. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's okay, well, from, thank you okay. so me, much, Lynn. Thank you. Really, really, thank you. We've got, it's been such a pleasure having you uh, on this podcast. The Heaven Hill Distillery uh, has been really shown up uh, to, to talk to folks about getting behind the, pulling the curtain back. A lot Both, of that was good reps. A lot of that was really good reps. Good reps. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, Dawson's here. James, is James here. even on the call? I can't James tell. is here. James is saving the day. <laughs> Jeff is here. They're we're just, well represented. We're just kidding. James really saved the day earlier today. Um, who do we have next on the? Okay, we have Glenn Morangi coming up. Uh, so check the Facebook uh, stuff. Uh, that stuff. I sound like a seven-year-old. It's fun. on the Facebooks. Um, it's a series yeah. of tubes. Uh, so Claire will be out there um, uh, letting you letting you know on the socials uh, what we're doing. Uh, and we have we're really happy to have Glenn Rangey coming up. And so please keep a lookout for that. If you have if you know anybody that wants to come work with us, we would like them because <laughs> just like every other restaurant and bar. We've done a lot of talking about the industry tonight. Uh, just like every other restaurant and bar in the world, you know, we all need people. Uh, we all need to get get back in this. In order to serve people, we need the people that love what we're doing. So if you know people that love this kind of stuff and would like a job, uh, Alley 26, would love to have you. Uh, I just want to say thank you all so much. This has been fun. This is a highlight of my day. I don't get to see people anymore, which is yeah. my job. <laughs> so to do it virtually, this is a really fun one. And anytime that you would like me to come back and talk about whatever, I'm happy to be here. Well, thank we you. We would host you at any time. Yeah, we can't we'd wait. love to pick your brain and just. When you're, when you're actually in the market again, in the fall, you said? Uh, I don't. Uh, I probably won't be full on till 2022, but fall will be some starting dates. So, well, we probably can't wait that long to see you again. So, we'll probably have to do something virtually. So and then, we can do something virtually again, or we can do some fun with your customers. We can do a happy hour and all that kind of stuff. I'm open for it. And uh, I just want to thank you because this is a pure joy for me tonight. So, <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for us as well. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.